Well, hey, welcome to Mr. Briefing. I'm Matt Steen. Joining me today is Todd Rhodes, as always, and also Todd Henry, the author of the book, The Accidental Creative, and also the founder of the, the company by the same name, Accidental Creative. Todd, welcome. Thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Matt. And Todd, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So Todd, um, Todd has written a book, and he does, he does creative consulting with, um, with agencies all, all over the world, it sounds like, and is about to launch another book um, called Die Empty. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But first, uh, Todd, just kind of wanted to, to talk to us a little bit what, about what a creative is. And we probably have some guys that are watching in the church world that are saying, well, I'm not a creative. What would you say to those guys? Yeah, I th- you know, I think that this word creative is something that we often get confused about. I think that we tend to think of creatives as those people who uh, paint or who write or who sculpt or who, you know, create novels, things, things of that nature. Um, I like to define a creative as anyone who turns their thoughts into values, someone who works with their mind, who has to figure it out every day. And I would suspect that probably 95 plus percent of the people watching this video right now would say, oh, yeah, that, that's me. I'm a creative because I have to make it up as I go. Um, and, the, and the pressures that people who deal with those dynamics have to face on a daily basis are not unsimilar to the kinds of pressures that the typical creative space, the people that are writing and designing and doing all of those things we think of as creativity, uh, because you're still having to solve problems. You're having to take the uncertainty of your environment and weave it together into some kind of solution. So when I work with what I call creatives, I'm typically working with anyone who has to work with their mind, turn their thoughts into value on a daily basis. Yeah, and I, I would imagine that that's definitely definitely a pastor, a church leader, somebody who's doing you know leadership training on a regular basis, leading small groups, all all that kind of thing. So that's that that's that's a good word, Todd. That, I really appreciate that because I think so often because we aren't artists or, or painters or, or when it, we tend to um, not think of ourselves as being creative, creating much of anything. So, and I, and I think it's unfortunate because I think a lot of times people miss some of the value that they're able to offer because yeah. they're not treating that part of their life, that part of their engagement with the kind of intentionality that it deserves. You know, if you want, I always tell people, if you want to be brilliant at the moment's notice, you have to begin far upstream from the moment you need a brilliant idea. The way yeah. you do that is just like with anything else. You have to plant seeds. You have to cultivate those seeds. You have to prepare yourself so that when you need a brilliant idea, whether you're leading or you're strategizing or uh, you're preparing a message to deliver to people or you're training or whatever it is, you have to prepare for that far in advance. You can't expect creativity to happen in the cracks and crevices of your life. Mm. So I, I want to talk about the new book here in a minute, but do you mind just kind of saying you know, what, are, what are one or two practices that we can put in that maybe, maybe a pastor of a church can put into his life now to start creating those seeds? Sure. Yeah. Well, so the, the first book, The Accidental Creative that you, that you kindly referenced a bit ago, um, dealt with the pressures of the create on demand world, which is what I call the, the dynamic that we experience. when We have to go to work and figure it out every day. And there were five key areas where I identified that we need to be building practices to prepare us to be brilliant when we, when we need to be brilliant. And those five areas are focus, which is about how we define the problems we're trying to solve. So, you know, it's hard to hit a target you haven't defined. So we have to be really good at defining the specific problems that we're trying to solve so that we can prompt our mind to be looking for solutions to those problems. Relationships. Um, this means staying connected to other people. There's a myth of the lone innovator, the lone wolf that's out there creating all of this great value. But we all know that innovation and brilliant work happens in the context of community. It's groups of people collectively grasping for the next. That's what innovation is. So we need to stay connected to others um, that in, in order to be effective. Energy management. This is a big one because we're great at managing our time. We are abysmal mm-hmm. at managing our energy. We're terrible. So we, we stack obligation after obligation, but then we have nothing left to offer. So we have to be good at pruning our life of things that, that seem really good but aren't the right thing right now. We have to be putting our resources in the right places consistently to do great work. Um, stimuli. These are the things that come into our head. These are all the things that become fodder for our creative process. But some of us are less than purposeful about the kinds of stimuli we allow into our world. And we have to be purposeful about communing with great minds, about stimulating our mind to think great thoughts, to think systemically, and um, processing information that might be outside of our comfort zone and applying that to the work that we're, that we're doing. Because the next great idea for your work probably won't come from staring harder at the problem. It's going to come from going outside of it and looking in all these potentially uncomfortable places and pulling those insights back into your work and applying mm-hmm. them. 
And then finally, hours. That's the fifth area. This is all about where you put your time. Time's the currency of productivity. But many of us adopt an efficiency mindset with our time rather than an effectiveness mindset, meaning that we'd rather stack our obligations because we feel the ping of productivity, but we're not doing the small things that are preparing us to be effective tomorrow and over the long term. Things like having unnecessary creating in our life. Where do you make something? Where do you experiment, develop your skills when you're off the clock? Do you do that or are you only creating when you have to? When somebody's paying you or when it's part of your job. Your little things like that over time aggregate into um, a well of inspiration, skill development, all of these things that we have to do to prepare ourselves to be effective tomorrow. So those five areas, focus, relationships, energy, stimuli, hours, they spell the acronym FRESH to make them uh, more easily memorable. Oh, that's, that's, that's great stuff, uh, Todd. Uh, and you mentioned, though, in your book, and uh, those things are great for our, our audience, pastors and church leaders primarily. Um, but what do you say to the church leader? I know you mentioned uh, some of kind of the antithesis things uh, that kind of keep you out of that creative, like uh, um, the law of comfort and fear and your ego sometimes that keep us from uh, – what, what do you say to the leader out there that's tired, that just says, I'm tired and I just want to be comfortable for the next month? Sure. Yeah. Well, I would say a couple of things. You're, you're referencing some of some of what's in Die Empty, um, the, yeah. the new book. And, and uh, that, that phrase, Die Empty, sounds a little daunting. It sounds uh, maybe a little bit uh, morbid, you know. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's definitely uh, not a lollipops and rainbows kind of kind of title. Um, <laughs> but I think that what you're describing is the state that many people find themselves in. Yeah. It's, it's honestly, it's the reason why I started my work to begin with, because I was experiencing that and I was encountering many people who were experiencing that um, in the workplace. And typically this kind of I am completely fried. I, I just want to be comfortable for a little while. Just stop talking to me. Let me plop down in front of the television and disconnect and watch a ball game or something. You know, that kind of mindset, um, it, first of all, it's very warranted in a lot of circumstances. But I would say that it's often the result of a lack of intentionality and discipline, a lack of choicefulness mm-hmm. in how you're structuring your life. It's a, it's a lack of willingness to say no to things. And, you know, I know that we're, we're talking to um, – to uh, church leaders here, right? Um, it's funny how uh, expectations continue to rise. You know, I would, I would suspect on, on church leaders and any gap of engagement, I think, is filled by some other expectation that needs to be met. Um, you know, and I see this in the marketplace a lot, but I can only imagine the pressure that is on someone who's leading an organization that they really care deeply about. I mean, care deeply about to the point of, I will lay myself on the line for this organization or for these people I'm serving, um, yeah, I don't meet many people in the marketplace who are w- willing to say, yeah, I would take a bullet for my bottle of orange juice, you know, but, but I, I would imagine there are probably a lot of church leaders listening who would say, yeah, I would take a bullet for my, for my, um, for my congregation, for the people I lead, for my team. And so when you care that deeply about something, you know, you can always push yourself to go an extra five minutes, an extra hour to make an extra trip, to have an extra conversation. It's really easy to do that, but in aggregate over time, um, that can really have a detrimental effect on your ability to, to provide the value that you're really being charged with providing. Um, and so, you know, I mean, not to, we'll, we'll, I'll go ahead and, and dive into my faith tradition, right, and pull it out because that's kind of, you know, it's the audience here. But, I mean, you see this in the life of Jesus. Jesus was good at saying no to people. You know, yeah. Jesus said no to people a lot, actually. Um, and we see him withdrawing and we see him going off to places and, and spending time on his own. And then, you know, in, in one circumstance, his disciples come to him and say, where have you been? You know, there are all these people looking to you, for you. Why aren't you here? There's a lot of work to be done. He said, no, we're going to go to the next city, right? Well, yeah, there was a lot of great work to be done there, but that wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was supposed to move on to the next place. But we're terrible at following that example. Instead, we think we have to do anything and everything all the time. And in so doing, we exhaust our ability to, you know, when, when the time comes, when there is a genuine opportunity to add the value that we're wired to add, we have nothing left to give because we're not being rhythmic about how we engage. That hurts. <laughs> you had to well, hey, I, I tell you, I, whenever you point a finger, there are three pointing back at you. And I'll tell you, it's, that's the case in my circumstance. I mean, I, I care very deeply about my writing, about the, the companies I work with, the clients I work for. I feel very, very deeply about that. Uh, 
I feel incredibly deeply about my family simultaneously, right? So I have to be careful to make sure that I'm doing these things in my life. And, and that, you know, what I just said is something I'm telling myself is I'm getting ready to launch a book. I'm about to speak in 17 cities in the next 25 days. You know, it's, it, it is a crazy time, but I have to remind myself, you know, life is not about balance. We're not made that way. We're not made for balance. We're made for rhythm. And there's a difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you are going to pour yourself fully and sometimes you need to disconnect and you need to refill your well or you'll have nothing left to give. Instead, we try to find this equilibrium where I'm just slightly below fried all the time. That is a recipe for disaster. You can't do that. It's not about balance. It's about rhythm and you have to embrace that. Yeah, that's good stuff. That's, that's, that's good. That's hard. Tell us, so, so, <laughs> Tell us, tell us a little bit more about, about rhythm, you know, how in these, in these heavily sustained periods of activity that, you know, you're about to launch into and yeah. happens in all of our lives, how do you maintain rhythm? I mean, how, what, what disciplines do you put into your life in order to keep it from getting out of rhythm? Yeah. So, so um, I mentioned, I'm going to be, I'm going to be speaking a lot over the next month. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I am to be completely forthright, people pay me a lot of money to show up for one hour and deliver a tremendous amount of value in one hour to a couple thousand people, right? That's right. what it looks like when I come and I speak someplace. Um, it, it's not sufficient for me to come up there on stage and say, you know, I'm really sorry I don't have the energy that I need to have right now because, you know, on the plane ride, I tried to get a bunch of email done and then I had to write a couple of, you know, guest posts or a couple of articles and I'm working on a couple of things with some clients and I'm sorry, I just don't have the energy. No, they're paying me, they're flying me sometimes halfway around the world to come deliver content for one hour to their audience. Um, I, I don't get to make that choice. I have to be on during that hour. So guess what? Around that time, I make sure that I'm building space and rhythm and other things into my life. I have other work I have to get done, but do you think I'm firing off emails 10 minutes before I run on stage in front of 2,000 people? No, absolutely not. I'm not, right? I mean, I have time to get centered, to get focused. I have buffers built into my life. And then guess what? On the airplane, I make hay while the sun's shining, right? I try to get all my work done or I try to get work done in other pockets. And the same principle applies in, in all of our lives. There are things that we do that only we can do, that we are uniquely equipped to do. And yet sometimes those things, because we're really good at them, because they come naturally to us, sometimes those are the things that we, uh, we take for granted. We, we operate by default in those areas because we think, well, I, I, can, I can just coast and get most of the value out of that. And we don't put our full selves into those things. And instead we try to sprinkle a little bit of ourselves across everything that we're doing. And in so doing, we're not adding the real value that we have to offer. So we have to decide, all of us have to decide, what are the things that I have to deliver on? And then how do I build structures into my life to ensure that the other things, the less important things aren't getting in the way of that? You know, so again, some of those practices might include, you know, rhythms around focus. So defining your work, knowing what it is you're really trying to do today and not just being carried along by your work. Like so many of us are, we're just pulled along by the expectations of the day, but stopping to define your work and saying, what am I really trying to accomplish today? Right. Um, staying connected to other people. When you get busy, it is easy to isolate yourself. It's easy to close yourself off from other people, but you need to stay connected. You know, we don't like relationships when we're busy because relationships are messy. They're the black box. You never know, right? right. Like you, you walk in thinking you're just going to sit down and have a great, nice coffee with someone and they say, oh, my cousin died last night. And then all of a sudden you're in a, a two-hour conversation and you're trying to counsel them and, and uh, grieve with them and it's, you know, it gets messy. So we, we tend to say, well, I'm going to eliminate that variable from my life. But when you do that, you close yourself off from right. energy and, and resource. So those, are, I mean, we, we have to be careful to build those kinds of rhythms into our life if we want to stay effective. That's 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 great, and Todd, this has been this has been a fantastic time, and I'm surprised it's it, we're we're getting up towards the towards the end of our time together. So that's because I talk too much. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you, you got to be pretty substantial if you can get a word in edgewise with Todd and I, but you know, <laughs> good work on that. So, so to finish up our time, tell us um, if you had one thing that you could tell the church leaders that are watching watching this now. You know, one one last word of wisdom that you could pass along to them. What would it be? Yeah, so this, and this is, I guess this is really the message that's been burning in my bones for several years, and it's, fortunately, it's the subject of my new book, Die Empty, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. Um, 
you know, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine was, uh, was leading a meeting. We were all in a, a group together, and he, he asked this kind of out-of-the-blue question. He said, what do you think is the most valuable land in the world? Right? And um, people started throwing out all these answers, and, you know, everybody was wrong. He said, no, the most valuable land in the world, I think, is the graveyard. Because in the graveyard are buried all of the unlaunched businesses, all of the unreconciled relationships, the unwritten novels, all of these things that people said, I'm going to get around to that tomorrow. I'll start that tomorrow. And one day their tomorrows ran out and they took their best work to the grave with them. And so that ground is the most valuable land because all of that value is buried with them. They didn't take the time to get it out and offer it to others. So the one thing I would offer up to those watching is this. Every single day of your life, you are building a body of work. You are building a body of work and you build it by how you spend your focus, your assets, your time, and your energy. Those are your four finite sources at your disposal. How you choose to put those things, where you choose to put those things, and how you choose to spend them ultimately determine your body of work. And at the end of your life, you will have a body of work to point to. You will. We're all building it. Whether we're doing it purposefully or not, we are building a body of work. The question is, will that body of work represent what you care about at the end of your life? Or will you get to the end of your life and point to the body of work, the places you added value and say, that, that doesn't at all represent me. You know, so be purposeful every day about where you put your focus, your assets, your time, and your energy. Be choiceful about those things because that is how you build your body of work, which by the way is any place you add value. So it's relationships, it's, it's every place else. Be choiceful about that because at the end of your life, that is the thing that will stand as the biggest testament to what you really believe. Wow. Well, Todd, thank, thank, you, thank you for your time with us. Um, really, really appreciate that. I've got a lot of thinking to do. After after this time, I think it's going to be uh, so, some difficult thinking that has to that has to take place. Even so, thanks thanks for challenging me. Thanks for challenging um, our, our our leaders today. The book um, is die empty. It's um, we'll have a link to it in the show notes. Feel free to go ahead and buy twelve, thirteen, fifteen copies. You know, help Todd's kids go to college. <laughs> and Todd, thank, thanks again. Thanks for, again for our, for your time with us today. Thanks, um, before we wrap up, how can people yeah. find, find more about uh, you? The best way to find me is at toddhenry.com, T-O-D-D-H-E-N-R-Y.com. Sounds great. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Thank you, Todd.